So today I'm doing my December mid-month wrap-up. That is to say, all the books that I read in the first half of December. So stick around to see what they were. Well, hey friends, Roger here and welcome to my channel, Rogers Reads. So today I'm doing my December mid-month wrap-up. I typically uh, split up my wrap-up into two parts. Those books I read in the first half and then those books I read in the second half. So today we're talking about all the books that I read during the first half of December. So the first book that I want to talk about is a book entitled Six Months Later. And that's written by Natalie D. Richards. And I'm not even sure how this book ended up uh, catching my attention. But those of you who've watched my channel for a while know that I love mind-bendy books surrounding the idea of memory. So the premise of this book was really intriguing. So um, this is a young adult mystery thriller. The story opens during the month of May and follows a high school girl named Chloe Spinnaker, Spinnaker, I think her name was, who uh, falls asleep in study hall. So when she wakes up from her uh, tiny nap, it is now November. Somehow, six months have passed, and she does not remember a single thing about them. But that's not all. Her life is now completely different. So, where she was once just a mediocre student, she is now at the top of her class and is being recruited by Ivy League universities. So, yes, she's now apparently super smart. She's also dating a guy named Blake Tanner, the most popular guy in school, someone to whom she's barely spoken two words to over the years, though he has always been her secret crush. And, uh, and actually, Chloe herself now is super popular at school. Also, her best friend Maggie is no longer speaking to her, and she has no idea why. Oh, and she also seems to be involved with the school bad boy named Adam Reed, another boy she barely knew or has spoken to until now. Actually, she finds herself strangely attracted to the bad boy, to uh, Adam, even though she's uh, supposedly dating Blake. So now, Chloe is on a quest to find out what happened to her during those missing six months. And as she soon learns, remembering could prove deadly for her, especially when she gets close to the truth of figuring things out. So yes, I really enjoyed this one. It was a lot of fun. So I wanted to read a couple of Christmas books this month, or should I say holiday books this month, because I did read one Hanukkah book, and uh, I try to do that during the month of December. And usually I have a few books that I reread every year, a couple of favorites, but this year I decided to mix things up and uh, read some new books that I haven't read. So the first one is entitled Merry Christmas, Mr. Miggles, written by Eli Easton. So this was a fun, small town holiday romance that uh, has been on my TBR list for quite some time, so I was happy I finally got to it. Plus, the story takes place at a library, which automatically uh, ticked the right box for me. So our story follows 24-year-old Toby Kincaid, who is a junior librarian in the town of uh, Sandy Lake, Ohio. He spends his days at the library with his enigmatic boss, Sean Miggles, on whom uh, Toby kind of harbors a not-so-secret crush. Toby would love to get closer to Mr. Miggles, but his boss keeps a distance. And also, Toby notices that there seems to be kind of a darkness or a sadness surrounding the man, as though he's gone through some sort of horrendous event or some trying times in his life. So the calmness of Toby's days come to a screeching halt and the story takes kind of a darker turn when Sean is accused of a horrendous crime that could destroy him. A crime that Toby knows the man did not commit. So Toby's determined to help his boss to prove the man's innocence, but in order to do so, he ends up unearthing some of that darkness in Sean's past. So, you know, this was such an endearing, sweet story that really tugged at the old heartstrings. It wasn't just about love, but also about community, uh, family, commitment, and doing what's right. So, uh, yeah, I thought this was a story with a huge heart that I really enjoyed. So the next book I'm going to talk about is entitled The Winter Spirit, 
by Indra Vaughn. And you know I love me a holiday story with a ghost. So uh, this one caught my attention. And it's also been in my TBR for quite a while. And it, and it follows a young man named Nathan, aka Nathaniel, who runs a B&B, &B, which just so happens to be haunted by a ghost named Gabriel who has taken it upon himself to play matchmaker with Nathan's guests. So Nathan has been kind of used to Gabriel's tricks and uh, matchmaking over the years and does his best to pretty much ignore the ghost. So as we learn, Gabriel has been trapped in the house for nearly a hundred years and his time is coming to an end. That is to say, unless he can make someone fall in love Gabriel will cease to exist and will face only darkness or oblivion. So to add to the intrigue, one of Nate's former crushes is coming to the B&B. &B. So if Gabriel can get them together and fall in love, maybe he'll get to move on. But of course, things are not always as they seem. So yeah, this was such a sweet and enjoyable read. And I, you know, I was kind of in the mood for a fluffy holiday romance and this one fits the bill perfectly. Though it's a short book, I think it comes in only at about 135 pages or so, it was quite a satisfying read. And I think it would have made a fantastic full-length novel. So all in all, quite a heartwarming and romantic Christmas story with a delightful characters and banter. So the next book I'm going to talk about is entitled Secret Admirer by D.J. Jameson. And this wasn't a holiday romance, but just a basic uh, romance. It's a super sweet, friends to lovers, uh, slow bird romance that follows our two main characters, Ace and Benji who are both attending the same university. So Ace is a couple of years older than Benji and is the best friend of Benji's brother, Jeremy. Now Ace promised Jeremy that he would kind of keep an eye on Benji and look over the boy to ensure that he doesn't feel too alone at the uh, university. Jeremy and ben Benji, the brothers, they were supposed to both attend the university together, but Jeremy accepted an internship, I do believe, somewhere else. So he kind of feels a little bit guilty for abandoning Benji, so asked his friend Ace to keep an eye on him. Now Benji has had a lifelong crush on Ace, even though Ace is supposedly straight. And as for Ace, well, he may not be so straight as everyone thinks. Uh, he's beginning to accept that he's bi-curious and can no longer ignore his ever-growing attraction to Benji. But initially, he decides not to act on that attraction because uh, given that his friend asked him to keep an eye on his brother, not seduce him. But when Benji begins feeling kind of down in the dumps, Ace starts sending him anonymous uh, gifts and notes from a secret admirer in the hopes of uh, cheering Benji up. But after Ace begins sending the gifts, he can no longer deny his feelings for Benji and decides to come clean. But of course, things do not go so smoothly as planned and uh, all sorts of hijinks ensued. So, you know, I really love the secret admirer angle in the book. I mean, who wouldn't love having a secret admirer? Though, of course, uh, I imagine there's a fine line between a secret admirer and a stalker. But still, I thought that this story was sweet and I love the emotion and the reasoning behind it, simply trying to make Benji feel better about himself. Oh, and it's also worth mentioning that Benji really doesn't believe anything that Ace tells him, figuring that Ace is just being nice to him because his brother told him to be. So from Ace's point of view, the secret notes and the gifts are the perfect solution. So all in all, this book about bisexual awakening, a, a mildly forbidden romance, complicated families, and first love was a hit. So the next book I want to talk about was entitled The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. So this was a Goodreads Reader's Choice Award winners or one of the winners for 2020. And given that I love stories about alternate or parallel universes, the synopsis really caught my attention. So this book ended up being another five-star read for me and I found it absolutely phenomenal, a magical even. So the story follows Nora Seed, 
who has hit rock bottom. She's just gotten fired. Her cat just died. And she's estranged from her family and she's alone. She actually just broke up with her fiance uh, two days before the wedding. So now she's pretty much consumed by regret over the opportunity she didn't take and the decision she didn't make. So she then finds herself thrust in the in-between, which is a place between life and death. A place that looks different for everybody. So for some people, it resembles a video store. For Nora, it's a gigantic library, which is a big run by her old uh, grade school librarian, Mrs. L. But this is no ordinary library, however, but rather it's a magical one. And Mrs. Elm explains to her that every book in the library contains different versions of her life, of Nora's life, uh, different possibilities. So how many of us have wondered how our lives might have been different if we've made certain decisions or didn't make others? For instance, what our lives would have been like if we just passed by our current spouse instead of stopping to introduce ourselves. Or maybe what our life would have been like if we pursued a dream of playing piano or uh, being a rock star rather than going into accounting. Well, Nora has a chance to find out. So each book of the limitless books in the library contains endless possibilities. How her life would have turned out if every one of her decisions had been different. All she has to do is touch a book and she's immediately living that life. So when she's in a life, she can leave any time she becomes disillusioned with that life. But if she finds the right life, a life in which she can be truly happy, she can then stay. Of course, it'll be up to her to decide exactly what it is that constitutes perfect happiness. So, but what she does is ends up exploring many, many different lives, each with different possibilities and outcomes. And she comes to many eye-opening realizations along the way. So, you know, I really loved watching her grow and observe how her beliefs and worldview change as a result of her, uh, her new experiences. So, you know, I could really gush endlessly about this book because I loved it on so many levels. So I'm guessing that many of us have dreamed about a library like this, uh, the ability to have a do-over for some of our decisions, or maybe that's just me. But uh, yeah, this book, this was such an emotional, hard-hitting read with many important themes. It's a story about regrets, mistakes, community, about uh, giving up, about insecurities, unrealized plans, about living other people's dreams instead of your own, as well as about what could have been and depression. So this is the kind of book that forces you to take a good hard look at your own life and maybe ask yourself some pretty tough questions. So one idea that really stuck out for me in this book was that just because a path or decision is different than the one you took doesn't necessarily mean that it would have been the right one or would have been better or easier. There was also the idea of the importance of little things, how a missed cup of coffee with a stranger could change the trajectory of your entire life. So in this way, each big and little decision impacts who we are and what our lives are like. And I think that there was a line in this book that said something like, never underestimate the big importance of the small things. So yeah, when I finished this dazzling book, I was pretty much breathless and uh, I immediately declared it a new favorite. You know, this is a type of story that I'm always longing to read and I'll definitely be rereading it in the future, uh, probably sooner rather than later. So the next book that I read this month uh, thus far is a holiday book and it was entitled Ben's Bakery and the Hanukkah Miracle written by Penelope Peters. So this story is about a baker and a hockey coach, a couple of my favorite things in stories, so I was excited about this one. And it follows our two main characters, Ben Daniels and Adam Bernard, both who are Jewish. 
Ben runs a kosher style bakery in Boston and he's just barely getting by. Three years prior, he was a champion speed skater and an Olympic hopeful before a horrible accident on the ice put an end to his dreams. Now, Adam, our other character, uh, coaches a teen hockey league in Montreal. So once a professional player, he also had given up his dream of uh, playing in the NHL to take care of his ailing father, uh, a retired rabbi. So when Adam and his team are invited to take part in a prestigious uh, tournament in Boston, which happens to take place during the week of Hanukkah, he accepts, though he's uh, hesitant to leave his father for the holiday, but he does not want to disappoint his young players by turning it down. So when Adam and his team pay a visit to Ben's bakery, the attraction between the two men is instantaneous and the two embark on a week-long fling. But the more Adam hangs out with Ben and gets to know the man, the more he wants to stay in Boston with him. So when Adam receives a coaching job offer from the NHL, offering to coach a team right there in Boston, he begins to wonder whether it's feasible to begin planning his future out with Ben. But as we learn, Adam has some shall we say, religious prejudices that could destroy the relationship before it even gets started. So the two characters did have some great chemistry between them that was dampened by the continuous spats surrounding the different views on what it means to be Jewish. Now, there are a couple of times where it seemed as though they were not, they were not going to be able to conquer their differences, but each misunderstanding is resolved fairly quickly. So in this way, religion plays a huge part in this book. More specifically, the idea of how one does or should exercise one's faith. So I found the discussion fascinating uh, about the role of religion in one's lives, the complexities of faith, the manner in which people exercise their religions, as well as religious beliefs versus cultural influence, uh, all of which I really did find fascinating. But the highlights of this story really for me were the junior hockey players. They were so much fun and had me giggling more than on one occasion. They had such uh, delightful personalities. And the banter between them and their coach was absolutely priceless. All of which really added an extra enjoyable element to the story. So the next book that I read was entitled Teddy Spencer Isn't Looking for Love, written by Kim Fielding. So I've read a couple of this author's paranormal novels, and this is the first contemporary that I've read by them. And this is a fun enemies to lovers slash opposites attract type of romance that follows Teddy Spencer, our narrator who works for an up and coming Chicago design firm called Ready Flora, I do believe. Now Teddy is not amused when his boss puts him on a high profile project with his nemesis, the stodgy and abrasive uh, software engineer named Romeo. Yes, that's his real name, Romeo, who also happens to be quite cute. You know, I also learned about smart vases in this story, something I never even knew existed. And that's the uh, project that the two guys are working on. So if working together wasn't enough, the boss then sends them on a business trip together to Seattle to meet with a wealthy and somewhat eccentric potential investor named Joyce Alexander. Oh, and there was a mix-up at their hotel, so not only do they have to share a room, but there's only one bed in the hotel. So, yeah, you know, I really enjoyed watching these two learn about each other over the coming days and seeing them both kind of overcome their hostilities. It was fun how their initial impressions of the other slowly fell away as they began to discover new and admirable facets of the other's uh, personality, all of which led to a fierce devotion on both of their parts by the end of the book. Their transitions from enemies to lovers is really quite sweet and uh, heartwarming, and I ended up adoring both of these characters. Now, the only thing I didn't really care for was the insta-love aspect of the story. Though they were co-workers prior, they really didn't know each other at all until, they, uh, until this trip. 
So they went from pretty much barely knowing each other to eternal declarations of love within just a few days. So those of you who are, who are not a fan of insta-love may find that, a, again, a tad off-putting. But apart from that, I found this to be a sweet and tender, perfectly constructed story with diverse characters and a heartwarming storyline. And the last book I want to talk about is entitled Here the Whole Time, written by Vitor Martins. So the story was originally published in Portuguese, and I think it's a couple of years old already, but has just been translated into English and is now available in that language. So the story takes place in Brazil and follows a 17-year-old, Felipe, a fat gay kid who is relentlessly bullied at school because of his weight and because of that has several body image issues and insecurities. He's looking forward to his school break, uh, 15 days of quiet and of solitude at home with no kids, no teasing. So when his mother informs him that Caio, I think this is how you pronounce his name, the neighborhood kid from apartment 57 will be staying with them while Caio's parents are out of town, Felipe panics. Not because Caio hasn't uh, has ever teased him because he hasn't, but rather Felipe is distraught because he's had a crush on Caio for years and has no idea how he'll manage being with the boy in close quarters for 15 days. But as the story progresses, Felipe begins to realize that Caio staying with them might not be as much of a disaster as uh, he'd originally thought. So in the coming days, the two boys learn about each other and also learn about themselves in the process. So it was fun discovering how each of them totally changed their perception of the other once some of these self-imposed walls came down. Now I will say that it was heartbreaking to read Felipe's insecurities about his body, his self-loathing, and the anxiety that he experiences. We also learned that Kyle has his own issues to overcome, and it was enduring to see how together they each began the healing process as the story moved forward. You know, there were so many great and positive messages in this book regarding body image, uh, sexuality, and even therapy. So I thought the character arcs in this story were phenomenal, and I adored seeing the natural transformation of both of our characters throughout the pages, especially Felipe, um, as he came to realize that body size is not what defines him. So this way, I love the tender conversation around body shaming and body insecurities, and the author also tackles the topic of bullying in a heartfelt way, and I really enjoyed seeing the bullies put in their place. The ending of the story was absolutely lovely, and it warmed my heart to see all of Felipe's deeply entrenched insecurities come crashing down as both boys end up pretty much overcoming their fears and discovering a new inner strength. And there is a romance here, and a romance was really sweet and tender. Absolutely perfect, I thought. And each boy finding his own self-confidence added to that perfection. So all in all, this is an endearing, wholesome, feel-good story with a huge, huge heart that I am so glad I read. So did you like this video? If so, please click the like button below as it really helps my channel to get discovered. And as always, I thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate all of your support and I'll talk to you all in the next video. Roger and out. Ooh.